Uh, so on Monday, uh, we had the big press conference with some Prince George's County leaders, our uh, county executive and police chief and other members of uh, council. Uh, some critics were saying that prosecutions have fallen under your leadership. How do you respond to that? I have no idea what they're talking about. When I look at, especially our juveniles uh, cases, we have an over 90% conviction rate for juvenile cases. You know, we have uh, got petitioned to our office about 368 cases this year. And I can tell you, uh, when I look at our carjacking stats, our gun stats, we have very high conviction rates. So what I would say is that a lot of times people don't have accurate information. And I think it is damaging to the public when people put out information that just isn't true. But here we are today to correct the record. Okay. So under your leadership, when it comes to uh, juvenile carjacking, um, what is your conviction rate when it comes to that? Well, I can tell you that we have an over 90% conviction rate when it comes to juvenile carjackings. Just this year, uh, we have 58 cases that have been sent to us. Of those, 33 have, uh, have already had their merits hearings and the individuals were found involved. We have 23 pending. We only had to dismiss one, and that was because of lack of sufficient evidence. And one individual failed to appear, and so they're in warrant status. So all of these cases will be prosecuted, and we have an excellent uh, rate of conviction. You talked about it Monday during your news conference with us, and you said how you kind of broke down what has to happen in order to formally press charges against someone and then for it to move forward, uh, that you have to have sufficient evidence. Yes. So talk about like that one case you had where you had to dismiss it or couldn't pursue it, rather, sure. uh, because of that. Oftentimes, uh, especially with carjacking cases, uh, they are the most challenging cases to prove. Because not only do you have to prove that the person was in the carjacked vehicle, but you have to prove that the person who was in the vehicle at the time that it was recovered was the actual carjacker. So oftentimes, police will recover a vehicle days after it was carjacked. The individual in that vehicle may or may not have been involved in the actual carjacking. If the victim can identify uh, the suspect, if they're not uh, surveillance cameras that can identify the sub suspect or phone downloads cannot put that suspect on the scene, it's almost impossible to ID that suspect as the individual who was involved in the carjacking. Now we can pursue other types of charges like uh, unauthorized use of a vehicle or auto theft because that individual knew or should have known that the vehicle was a stolen vehicle. So these are tough cases, but clearly we prove them every single day and we have a very strong record of conviction. Repeat offenders is a big topic uh, with people. And I know we seem to be having somewhat different summers. So summer 2021, it was, oh, let's not over-criminalize children when they commit crimes. Let's not you know, send them to jail for the rest of their life. But now Prince Georgians are saying, I'm afraid to go to the gas station because kids are out of control. They're stealing cars. I don't want to get carjacked. Uh, you mentioned in the, your news conference on Monday that when it comes to punishment and that is rendered, that is somewhat beyond your control. So what is it that you sure. can do as a state's attorney uh, when it comes to punishing anyone, be it a juvenile or an adult, uh, once they've committed a crime and been convicted of said crime? Well, let me just say this. I have to understand my role in the system. My role is to prosecute to hold individuals accountable, uh, to protect the interest of our victims in our community. And that's what we do through prosecution. It is up to a judge to, de to determine the appropriate sentence or sanctions, which is the terminology used in juvenile court. And so the judge hears from the state. The judge also hears from the Department of Juvenile Services, who are really the experts in children. They also hear from defense counsel. They will also consider any reports uh, or evaluations that have been conducted on that child. And then the judge makes a decision in which he has, he or she has to determine what is the, in the best interest of the child. That is the standard in 
juvenile law. That is the standard that's set out by the state. It is best interest of the child. Now often, our office, who has the responsibility to look out for the victims and the greater community, believe that, it's, it, that it is important to have consequences when it comes to rehabilitation and looking out for the best interests of the child because it's not okay for a child to commit violent acts in our community or anywhere. And so we do believe very strongly that accountability and consequences are important to any rehabilitation plan. However, it is not solely up to us to determine what that plan looks like. And so we respect everyone in the system, we understand their roles, and we respect their decisions. We don't always agree. We don't always agree. Um, oftentimes, we don't agree, we disagree. However, uh, that is our role. Our role is to hold people accountable, which we do. Our role is to bring cases, strong cases to court, which we do. Um, and our role is to make appropriate rec recommendations, which we absolutely do. But we are not responsible ultimately for determining what the quote unquote punishment will be. Okay. What do you think, or do you think anything needs to change within law enforcement in order to, for you guys to be able to continue to work together and have the best working relationship for Prince Georgians, Georgians? <laughs> so let me just say this. We work very well with law enforcement. In fact, I met with our law enforcement officers twice today. Prince George's County Police Department and the Prince George's County State's Attorney's Office works together every single day. So there won't be any change. There's no need for, I mean, there's always need for improvement, obviously. But what you saw on Monday was not the normal course of business. That was politics. That is separate and apart from real work, which we do every single day. And that real work is being done in the courtrooms. That real work is being done by having meetings. We met yesterday, actually, uh, with our uh, law enforcement partners, as well as our federal partners, to discuss issues of criminal justice in Prince George's County. So again, what you saw on Monday was something that was abnormal, that was politicians wanting to politic. Uh, what I see and what I do every day is my job. Uh, someone criticized uh, the current administration, saying that previous administrations had lowered crime, or lowered crime throughout the county, uh, that you know punishments were stiff during that time and crime was down and called you out by name um, and said that you know this administration is not doing enough do you think that that is a fair representation being that uh, we coming out of a global pandemic right <laughs> um, that affected everyone what is your response to people who feel like you know under your leadership things have changed for the worse I actually I think that when you look all around this country there are real issues. Our children are not in school like they used to be. We have families that are still in crisis. We're dealing with mental health, with trauma, with so many different factors. Uh, so what I will say is that we all have to do better and we all have to do more. Um, but pointing fingers, saying that this person's responsible or that person's responsible is just not accurate. We have a very high conviction rate here. In fact, we have a 98% conviction rate in our homicides, 98%. So we are absolutely doing our jobs. Uh, we are working hard every single day to protect the interests of the people of Prince George's County. There are no statistics that are actually factual that would suggest anything else. Political theater is not a part of our daily business and will never be a part of our daily business. And so um, that's why we're just presenting the facts to you. Um, we're letting our residents know that we are looking out for them every single day. I meet with families of, of individuals uh, who were lost due to gun violence. Um, I meet with victims of crime, serious crimes, and they are traumatized. And I don't want that in my community. 
So there is no way that I would not aggressively prosecute people. And we do that every single day. The numbers bear that out. Uh, so I think it's actually a disservice to the public uh, to provide false and inaccurate uh, and misleading information. And I would say shame on those who do so. Um, but again, my job is to just do my job, and that's what I'm going to continue to do. Let's talk about these kids, because um, you talk to victims, you have to talk to Absolutely. suspects. Um, in, in some of these cases where you're seeing children who have committed a crime, and they come before you multiple times, their names run across your desk multiple times, who are these children? What are some of the circumstances that they're facing that probably or could possibly uh, make them want to commit a violent crime? You know, we have a lot of folks who are coming, unfortunately, across the border from the District of Columbia that are committing offenses. Some of these individuals uh, live in, in very challenged uh, circumstances, and so I think they're being influenced by older children or adults, especially those who are committing carjacking. Sometimes they're carjacking for other people. Um, some of them are trying to survive, that is also correct, and some of it is just peer, peer pressure and wanting to do something that's fun. And unfortunately, this is not fun, this is serious business. If you're bringing a gun to any event, to any meeting, to, to, to go out with your friends, that means you need to do someone harm or do yourself harm. And that's what we've seen. We've seen kids who have engaged in carjackings, who not only potentially hurt their victim, but hurt themselves. Uh, we have seen kids get shot. Uh, kids get into serious car accidents where they are suffering um, just serious bodily injuries that may affect them for the rest of their lives. Uh, so, um, you know, no one circumstance or no one kid is the same. So I, I don't want to generalize, but there are many different factors. But one of the biggest factors is that kids are not in school. And so I think it's very important for uh, our school systems, both District of Columbia, Prince George's County, and, and elsewhere in our state to make sure that they are enforcing uh, attendance and notifying their prosecutors when um, individuals are not attending school regularly because we uh, can do something about it. We can en encourage and influence parents to do the right thing, which is to send their kids to school. You know, national studies suggest that the majority of juvenile crime is committed between the hours of one and seven. And the peak time is around three o'clock, which means that's around school time. They should be in school. If a child is learning and achieving, they're less likely to get involved in criminal activity. And so we have to not only make sure that our kids are in school, but we have to make sure that they are achieving when they're in school and getting the wraparound services that they need. You know, Judge, uh, Sheila Tillerson Adams yesterday uh, really, I think, did a wonderful job of talking about an important intervention program that she has been pushing for for years, which is like a, it's called a judge's school, where kids who are justice involved can get a formal education and also get the services that they need and their families can get the services that they need. Children live in the context of a family. If the family is broken, often we're dealing with broken children. And so how do we fix that? We fix that by giving them individualized attention in a structured environment. And so it is really important that I think our county look for more creative ways to deal with young people who are uh, committing offenses or who are likely to commit offenses. And I think that Judge Adams' idea of creating the school is key to solving a very important problem. And when it, when it is someone who's not from Prince George's County, who comes into the county and commits a crime, does it make it more difficult for you guys to do your job if they're not from the area, if they are from D.C. or somewhere like that, or Montgomery County? The difficult part is sometimes getting the child in custody. Um, because if the child uh, flees to the District of Columbia, then we have to go through a process to bring that child back to Prince George's County uh, to face the charges. Um, and so we have been working very closely with the Office of the Attorney General in the District of Columbia, as well as the Metropolitan Police Department 
in our sheriff's office to develop a, a good plan uh, to bring those kids back to face consequences. And so that has really worked. But that was through collaboration. And that's the other thing I want to mention. It's so important that we collaborate, that we have discussions. Back in 2011, when we had a similar spike in crime, guess what happened? The then county executive, Rashawn Baker, brought everyone to the table, did not point fingers, just said, hey, let's figure out how we can all make this work together. And guess what, guess what happened? They solved the problem. And so that's what I'm about. I'm about solutions. We absolutely have a problem. Um, everyone can see that. Um, but the solution isn't found in pointing fingers. The solution is found in everyone getting around the table, rolling up their sleeves, and doing the hard work, the hard work that we have actually done. And we're seeing great results from those individuals who we have helped. And so we have programs here, like Back on Track program, like our Emerging Adult program, for individuals who have committed offenses, they have taken responsibility for those offenses, and they are serving their time. But guess what? We're also providing them with resources, with uh, opportunities to develop themselves more fully, even while they're incarcerated, so that when they come back to our communities, they're less likely to offend. Those are the types of programs that we need to invest more in. Accountability is important, but rehabilitation has to be a part of any solution to fight crime. And so, again, here in the state's attorney's office, we have a tough job, we have an important job, and it's a serious job. It's a job that we do every day, and we do it well. And we will continue to work with all of our partners uh, as we do so daily. Uh, to ensure that the residents here are safe. Do you? Th how do you feel? Um, because I, I'm, I'm curious to know what you think. Because we had, you know, oh, punishments or, or charges are too s severe for children, or now they're not being charged enough. Do you feel like you're like everyone wants something different every few months? Do you feel like? The, yeah, we know? stay consistent in our message. Mm -hmm. We believe in accountability and we believe in appropriate punishment, period. So I have not changed. I don't change with the wind. This job is way too serious to do that. And so what's the, the political wishes of the day can't really influence the decisions that I make here in this office because I deal with people's lives, both you know victim, victims and defendants. And so um, we believe in accountability. Um, there is a variety of punishments or sanctions that are available in the juvenile system. We request uh, what we believe are the appropriate punishments. And it's really up to the judge to decide that on how a child will be handled. Um, but we make uh, appropriate uh, recommendations. And oftentimes we are asking for serious offenders that they be placed in uh, secured facilities so that they can be away from the community for a while and they can uh, be rehabilitated. So that is something that we ask for. We don't always get it, uh, but we again can't wring our fingers at the court and say that they're wrong because they have a standard too that they look at, which is best interest of the child. And they consider many factors in determining what they believe is in the best interest of that child. And so, um, really, this is hard work. We're all doing it. We're doing it together, those on this side of the justice system. And uh, we'll continue to provide good information to our public. Okay. And then lastly, what is, what is your <coughs> message to parents? What is your message to parents? What is your message to everyday citizens on things that they can do and be mindful of? Yeah, I think if you see a child uh, during the school day out, and you know that child should be in school, say something. You know, I think that we oftentimes just look at our children, we know that they need help, but we are not offering help. Um, for parents, we need you. We need parents to be involved. We need you to make sure that your children are in school, that they're getting a good education. We need to make sure that they're okay. And if you or your child needs help, we have government agencies that can assist them. 
We have uh, family services. We have social services. Uh, we have our library system. We have s the schools actually provide supplemental services to families as well. But you gotta be real. Be real with yourself. Are you okay? Are your kids okay? Because if they're not, they're gonna end up in the justice system and somebody else is gonna make a decision on whether or not uh, they're okay. And, and I think that's, you never want to put your life in someone else's hands. You know, I do, I do want to ask this too. Um, I obviously was not here when the uh, curfew was enforced previously in, in decades past. Um, did that create, or do you see this, I, you may not know the answer to this, but do you see this potentially creating an influx of children who are now placed in temporary care um, by social services because if they're be out beyond curfew, I read it yesterday, the second offense, you're detained, and if someone doesn't pick up within an hour, you're sent to social services. Is that going to, it's, can social services handle that? Uh, again, these were decisions made by this administration. My assumption is that they have a plan, and I think you should refer that question to them. So we have the Our Streets, Our Future initiative, uh, which is a anti-gun violence initiative, and it targets young people, those who are teenagers and young adults. Uh, we're really focusing on this age group because they are overrepresented in our justice system, especially when it comes to more violent offenses and our handgun offenses. And so uh, through this initiative, we bring resources to the community job opportunities, training opportunities, uh, as well as social service resources, uh, behavioral health resources. So it's really important that I think we look at our young people as whole people. Uh, some are broken, some need some fixing, some, some support, some mending, and uh, it is our job to help them achieve their goals uh, in a positive way. And so this initiative has been great. We've connected a lot of people with job opportunities, and I'm proud to say that we're continuing uh, this program uh, this year, and we have our next program in the Pickwick community on the 22nd of uh, uh, September. September. Okay.